Good evening, friends. And today, amongst us, we have Justice M.S. Murthy, a former judge from Andhra Pradesh High Court, who is currently chairperson of the Andhra Pradesh State Human Rights Commission, and who's a resourceful person, for, not only for the Judicial Academy, but also on a lot of webinars, like John Law CLC and Sham Padman. His sessions have always been well received. And today we thought, why not have a topic which has the interplay between the oral and documentary evidence, coupled with the fact that what are the practices in this part and rules of evidence in this regard. So the caption of the topic today is a few rules of evidence and courtroom practices on receiving oral and documentary evidence. Without taking much time, I would request Sir to share his insights. Very good evening. My hearty pronouns to all learned elders and my good wishes to angsters. It's indeed a distinct pleasure to be with you this evening and share my humble thoughts and views on the assigned topic. I hope and trust that at the end of the session, there will be a value addition to your knowledge banks. Law is an ocean, its horizons are ever widening. Its depths are unfathomable, Therefore, nobody can claim to be a master of law. Today's evening's subject is a vast topic. Every day, hundreds of trials, thousands of trials will be going on in the courts in the country. There will be many courtroom situations propping up every day during trials in one court or the other. Every day is a learning experience. So we are all students of law. And for me, Teaching is learning. Today I have got another opportunity to learn while interacting with all of you. Thank you so much. I thank the organizers to begin with. At the end of the trial, be it a civil proceeding or a criminal proceeding, there will be three kinds of evidence before the trial court. Oral evidence, documentary evidence and material evidence. Some youngsters may get a doubt whether there will be material evidence in a civil suit. The straight answer is Order 13 Rule 11, which says that in civil proceedings also material evidence can be taken, but the material objects will be marked in the same series as that of the documents. So there are three kinds of evidence. How to receive this evidence? And what are the courtroom practices in receiving evidence is the topic for this session and if possible for the next session also. Is there any order of production of evidence? That is the first question. Incidentally, the question is of what evidence can be given? Of what evidence can be given? We all know evidence may be given of Facts in issue. When we read section three of the Indian Evidence Act, we find what is a fact, what, what, may, what is the meaning of a fact. So evidence may be given of facts in issue and relevant facts is also the answer which we find in that provision of law. We can also see incidentally section five and other sections of chapter two of the act. But one important aspect is facts judicially noticeable need not be proved. Therefore, the court need not take evidence in regard to those facts. Similarly, facts admitted need not be proved. Section 57 and 58. Therefore, no evidence need be received so far as these two kinds of facts are concerned. Sometimes a fact may be admissible, but at the same time, it may also be relevant but still such an evidence is inadmissible. Supposing it's a privileged communication, it is inadmissible, inadmissible in evidence. Something is said to a lawyer by a client. The communication between the two is privileged. Though such evidence is admissible and relevant, the law says such evidence cannot be given. So please also note that evidence cannot be given as a fact, 
which a party is disentitled to prove by any provision of law for the time being in force of course then the next question is admissions i was mentioning it's a huge topic it's a genus confession is a species of it admissions are different kinds and then again confessions are different kinds we are not going into that topic today okay we also know when we are talking about facts facts are of two kinds physical facts and psychological facts physical facts you know are those facts which are perceived by the senses and then the psychological facts are those which mean and include anything of which a person is conscious we cannot give direct evidence of this these facts therefore these are called psychological facts then next question is order of production of evidence this is the next aspect i invite your attention to section 135 of the indian evidence act which says order of production of examination of witnesses the order in which witnesses are produced and examined shall be regulated by the law and procedure for the time being relating to civil and criminal procedure respectively and in the absence of any such law by the discretion of the court so where the order of production and examination of witnesses is regulated by either of the courts civil and criminal courts then we have to follow that order of examination supposing the courts are silent then it is the discretion of the court in the matter of production and examination of witnesses then what are the relevant provisions of the codes order 18 and rule 41 order 41 order 18 and order 41 are the two orders in the cpc which deals with this aspect so far as the criminal procedure is concerned chapters 17 19 21 and 29 of the code of criminal procedure why these provisions are important you know in every civil suit there will be issues in most of the criminal trials there will be charges or some accusations against the accused depending upon those accusations and charges in a criminal proceeding and the issues in a civil proceedings evidence will be let in for example coming to the criminal proceeding we know the cardinal rules of criminal jurisprudence the burden is always on the prosecution it is both legal and evidentiary burden it never shifts it's always on the prosecution the prosecution has to prove its case to the hilt and the benefit of doubt is also available to the accused so far as civil procedure is concerned there are two kinds of burden one is the burden of proof the other is the onus of proof onus of proof is the evidentiary burden which shifts from side to side during course of trial legal burden never shifts the importance of these aspects we understand when i illustrate with the following in this illustration see in a civil procedure after the pleadings are complete the court frames issues we all know issue must always be framed in the affirmative there should not be a negative employed in the issue while framing an issue unless there is a rule of evidence or a statutory provision reversing reversing the rule of burden of proof for that matter onus of proof that is the burden to introduce evidence for example in a suit on the foot of a promissory note the burden the legal burden is always on the plaintiff he has to prove the execution the passing of consideration and non repayment then only he will be entitled to a decree so in a civil proceeding in a suit on the foot of a promissory note the issue generally will be whether the suit prom promissory note is true valid and binding on the defendant that will be the issue but take a case where the execution is admitted but the passing of consideration is denied we find a provision in the negotiable instruments act section 118 
which reverses the burden of proof and says, when the execution is admitted and the consideration is denied, the onus of proof shifts to the defendant. Therefore, in such a case, the only issue that will be framed by the court is whether the suit promissory note is not supported by consideration, not is employed in the issue because there is a rule of evidence, there is a statutory provision which reverses the burden of proof and says that the initial onus is on the defendant. That's how the court has to bear in mind the rules of evidence regarding proof while receiving oral and documentary evidence for that matter, material evidence also. This is a very important aspect of the trial because unless the advocate thoroughly prepares and looks at the issues and the charges for that matter or the accusations in a criminal case, he shall not come forward to adduce evidence. Then another important aspect is rule three of order 13, which says rejection of irrelevant and inadmissible evidence. The court may at any stage of the suit, reject any document which it considers irrelevant or otherwise inadmissible regarding the grounds of such a rejection. So the next aspect is the court is bound to see whether the evidence being sought to be let in is either admissible and also relevant or relevant. It should be both admissible and relevant. So facts may be relevant, but may not be admissible. For example, as I was mentioning earlier, the suit promissory note is there, but it's not sufficiently stamped. It is relevant to prove the transaction of lending and borrowal, but at the same time, it is inadmissible because it is not sufficiently stamped. Similarly, a fact may be admissible but may not be relevant. Like for example, a person says, when the suit promise note is executed in Madras, he says at the alleged time of execution, he is not at Madras, he is at Mumbai. So, his statement that he is away from Madras, he is taking in a way a pre of alibi. In such a case, it becomes relevant, though it is otherwise irrelevant. That is how the court has to see both relevancy and admissibility at the time of receiving evidence. We have seen framing of issues, importance of framing of charges, order of examination, what are the guidelines for order of examination and production of evidence, and then we are now going to some courtroom practices. Who should begin? Again, Order 18 Rule 1 says that the plaintiff has a right to begin unless the defendant admits the facts alleged by the defendant, alleged by the plaintiff, and contends that either in point of law or on some additional facts alleged by the defendant, the plaintiff is not entitled to any part of the suit claim. I repeat, the plaintiff has a right to begin. Generally, the plaintiff must get into box first and then give evidence. Then the honest to introduce evidence shifts to the defendant. But in rarest of rare cases, where the defendant admits the facts eligible by the plaintiff and contends that either in point of law or on some additional facts eligible by the defendant, the plaintiff is not entitled to the relief. For example, the plaintiff files a suit on this put of a promissory note. The plaintiff admits, the, the defendant admits the execution of the promissory note as well as passing of consideration, but he contends that he discharged the debt. Therefore, the burden is on the defendant. Defendant has to get into the box and then adduce evidence about the alleged discharge. Then if he adduces sufficient evidence, then the one has to introduce evidence shifts to the plaintiff. The plaintiff will then be examined as the witness on the side of the plaintiff, right? This is how the pleadings and issues assume importance at the time of receiving oral and documentary evidence. 
then another aspect there are more than one issue in a suit in other words there are several issues in a suit and the burden of proving some of them is on the plaintiff and the burden of proving the rest of them is on the opposite party that is the defendant then the relevant rule is order 18 rule 3 order 18 rule 3 says evidence where several issues where there are several issues the burden of proving some of which lies on the other party the party beginning may at his option either produce his evidence on those issues or reserve it by way of answer to the evidence produced by the other party and in the latter case the party beginning may produce evidence on those issues after the other party has produced all his evidence and the other party may then reply specially on evidence so produced by the party beginning but party beginning will then be entitled to reply generally on the whole case i'll give an illustration the illustration is this a suit is filed for declaration of title and recovery of possession of an immovable property say house property the defendant is admitted in possession he contends in the defense apart from other contentions that he acquired title by adverse possession so one of the issues is whether the plaintiff is having right title and interest in the suit property is the first issue on which the burden is on the plaintiff the next issue is whether the defendant perfected title to the suit property by being in adverse possession that is the next issue so there are two issues on one issue the initial onus of proof is on the plaintiff and on the other the onus is on the opposite party namely the defendant therefore the plaintiff who begins the evidence adduces evidence about his right title and interest in the property and then leaves it there and says after the defendant adduces evidence on the adverse possession issue i will reply that is how order 18 rule 3 says the plaintiff can either reserve the right to adduce rebuttal evidence or in the alternative regarding the second issue also he may straight away adduce evidence without reserving right to adduce rebuttal evidence that is how order 18 rule 3 is worded right another important aspect is all facts except contents of documents can be proved by oral evidence so we come to oral evidence and documentary evidence then at this stage when we are talking about oral evidence oral evidence can be given of facts which are perceived by the five senses by the person who is giving evidence right here say evidence is inadmissible is the general rule there are six exceptions i am not going into those details today then we'll straight away go to courtroom practices we have prefaced our talk about a few rules of evidence regarding adduction of evidence order of production of evidence order of examination of witnesses for example a, a lady a married woman files a suit for whatever relief she says that being a lady married woman her husband is looking after her affairs therefore she says she will examine her husband first and she will be examined later then the question of right to begin comes here in my view order 18 rule 3a comes into play if the lady does not wish to appear she can straight away examine her husband as her witness to prove her case because always generally in the indian context so far as married women who are housewives the husband takes care and looks after the affairs of the entire family including that of the wife but in a peculiar case if the lady wants to be examined as a witness so she wants to give evidence 
but her preference is that she will examine her husband first. In such a case, she has to file a petition and seek permission of the court that after her husband is first examined, she will be examined later. After seeking such permission, she can examine her husband in the first instance. This is Order 18, Rule 3A, which is a courtroom practice. Then coming to compulsorily attestable documents. Compulsorily attestable documents are mortgages, bills, bonds, and gifts and settlement deeds. These are the four categories. But Andhra Pradesh High Court, full bench held, so far as bond is concerned, even though there is no attestation, if the other conditions which are required for fulfillment of a bond are there, it can be considered as a bond, no attestation is necessary. So we can take it that the other three documents are compulsorily attestable. So far as these documents are concerned, the document will be held to be proved if only an attestor is examined and he successfully proves the due execution by the executant. So when we go to this illustration, we can take up the example of a bill. Generally, when a bill is a document in dispute, the first question will, will be, who has to produce that document into court first? That means custody of the document. Supposing an attestor comes and files it, then the court may ask him, why, why are you having the possession of this will? How are you entitled to I mean, produce this document? It is for the beneficiary, the propounder, to produce it. Otherwise, you have to examine the custody of the document. So another important aspect which the court will take care while receiving oral and documentary evidence is the custody and the knowledge of the contents of the document provided when he is a beneficiary of the document. So this important aspect of law is that when person is producing a document, he must explain the custody of the document. Then only the further evidence of that witness will be taken. For example, a letter is written by A to B. If the letter is delivered, B is supposed to have possession of that letter. If the let letter is written and unserved, then A is supposed to have possession of the letter. So if it is undelivered, A will produce into court. If it is delivered to the addressee, the addressee B will produce it into court by explaining the custody. But take a case, B's son is producing the doc, that letter. Then he has to explain the custody of that letter as to how he came into custody of that letter which is addressed to not to him but to his father. Then generally being a son who is residing in the same house may explain saying that his father who is an old man having received it, gave it to him for preservation, it remained with him, therefore he is producing it. So in case of a will, a propounder produces the will generally, then after he formally introduces the document into evidence by saying, this is the bill executed by so-and-so, I am filing it into court, it will be marked, it will be exhibited only for the purpose of identification. Marking is not proof. Then after the attestor is examined, then the question of proved arises. Then the regular marking will be given. The marking which is given for identification will be confirmed during the course of evidence of the attestor of the document. Right. The all attesting, all documents which are compulsorily attestable shall be attested by minimum of two witnesses. Then the question is for proving those documents, how many witnesses shall be examined? The law evidence, law of evidence says. Examination of one witness is sufficient. But the crucial aspect is this. The requirement of law is attestation by two witnesses. But the law says, even if one witness is examined, there may be sufficient proof in some cases. What are those cases? If this witness, attestor who is examined, is able to prove attestation by two witnesses in his evidence, then his evidence completes due attestation 
and proof of due attestation by two attestors. Like for example, two attestors are present at the same time. And then one attestor attested the document, the other attestor saw the first attestor attesting the document. Then this first attestor also saw the second attestor attesting the document. Both of them saw the executant signing the document voluntarily with his free will and consent. Then either of the witnesses can come to the witness box and prove the due attestation by two witnesses. Then there is complete proof of attestation by two witnesses. But take a case where one attestor attested the document at one time, at, that is at the time of the executant signing the document. But another attestor attested the document later by taking an acknowledgement from the oral acknowledgement from the executant that he signed the document and it was already attested by the first attestor and at his request, he will attest as a second attestor on the document. Then naturally, one attestor cannot prove the attestation by two witnesses, then the evidence will be incomplete and will not be valid evidence to prove the attestation of document by two witnesses. This is a courtroom practice. On this aspect, there is one important courtroom practice. So far as a document like a Panchanama or a bill, which is attested by two witnesses, the party who wants to prove that bill or Panchanama for that matter, wants to examine two, two, two witnesses, namely two attestors of the will or two Panchas who were present at the time of preparation of the Panchanama. Then what happens? Generally, the first witness, the first attester or the first punch witness is brought to court. He is examined in chief. Then the cross-examining counsel will make a request that he will cross-examine both the attestors or both the punch witnesses at one and the same time. And he wants the cross-examination is to be deferred until the other witness is also examined in chief. That uh, such a request will be generally made. There is a logic in this because if uh, already that witness is cross-examined, then the other attestor or the other witness will know the line of cross-examination. He will come prepared and therefore the cross-examination of that witness later will be a futile exercise. Therefore, the trial courts generally would accord permission for cross-examination of uh, two witnesses who are namely attestors or punch witnesses to a document. The request being logical and in accord with natural justice, the court will grant request and that the and directs the party relying upon the bill or the panchanama to bring both the witnesses for cross-examination at one and the same time. This is a very important aspect. All the trial court lawyers and trial court judges must keep in mind such genuine requests which are in accord, accord with the principles of natural justice must be permitted and should not be declined. Another aspect on the same illustration. See, right, both the witnesses are brought to court. Their chief examinations are over. Now they are ready to be cross-examined. The cross-examining counsel says that when the first witness is being cross-examined, the other witness who is to be cross-examined on the same day should not sit in the court hall. He should be sent away from the court hall so that he will not know the line of cross-examination. He should not follow the cross-examination of the earlier witness. This is again a, a request which is in accord with the principles of natural justice. Therefore, the court will permit such a request. When the first, first witness, namely the attestor or the punch witness is being cross-examined, the other witness will be kept away from the court hall and he will be called after the first witness is completely cross-examined to the court hall for his cross-examination. Then, while examining a witness, a piece of moral evidence is objected to on any ground, maybe that he is not competent to speak that particular aspect, 
his evidence is hearsay therefore he ought not to speak and give evidence on that aspect the council may say who is leading the evidence that this evidence is not hearsay it is falling under the one of the exceptions six ex exceptions to the hearsay rule therefore the evidence can be permitted then in such cases what is the duty of the court the court is required to both record the question as well as the answer the question put to the witness and also the objection raised by the counsel the reply given to the objection and then the answer given by the witness here i would like to invite your attention to order 18 rule 11 question objected to and allowed by court where any question put to a witness is objected to by a party or his pleader and the court allows the same to be put the judge shall take down the question the answer the objection and the name of the person making it together with the decision of the court thereon but here one important aspect which i would bring to your notice is bipin shanti lal panchal's case it's a judgment rendered by three honorable judges of the supreme court and it was rendered by justice kt thomas what is happening in trial court is when a piece of oral evidence is objected to at the time of recording of evidence and when the court is taking a decision either allowing the objection or overruling the objection then immediately the parties are going to higher courts by filing revisions and getting the matter stayed therefore matters are getting delayed therefore justice kt thomas in this very important decision has said like this in para 14 the decision is reported in ar 2001 supreme court 1158 ar 2001 supreme court 1158 he suggested that there is a need for recasting of the practice and which is better suited for the trial courts whenever an objection is raised during evidence taking stage regarding the admissibility of any material or item of oral evidence the trial court can make a note of such objection and mark the objected document tentatively as an exhibit in the case or record the objected part of the oral evidence subject to subject such objections to be decided at the last stage in the final judgment so what is the advantage if the question is recorded the objection is recorded the reply given by the other counsel to the objection is recorded and the answer is also recorded there will be a complete picture of what happened in the trial court on record then the appellate court will be in, at an advantage to consider this piece of evidence and either admit it and rely upon it or may reject it by saying that the objection is valid supposing this is not recorded forever important piece of evidence will be absent from the record therefore when a oral evidence is objected to the duty of the court is to record first the question then the objection raised then the reply given to the objection and also the answer with the details of the counsel who raised the objection and who answered the objection right this is a very important decision between shanti lal panchal's case then i was mentioning about oral evidence and certain objections on this aspect we can also consider another illustration sometimes an objection may be raised to the admissibility of evidence like for example a dying declaration is being sought to be introduced into evidence then an objection may be raised by stating that the person who made that statement has died has to be first proved the relevant provision is section 104 of the indian evidence act 
So when a person wants to prove the dying declaration of B, then that person must first prove that B's death. So in case reliance is sought to be placed on a relevant, relevant fact, which is in a statement made by a person who is dead or who cannot be found, then an objection may be raised as to the admissibility of evidence. Then in such a case, the fact that the said person who made the statement is dead or cannot be found must be proved. So this is how the order of adducing evidence comes into play. Right. Then sometimes questions regarding bad character are put. Such evidence is irrelevant both in civil and criminal cases because the facts have to be proved on their merit, be it a charge or an issue has to be proved on its merit. Simply because a particular person is a thief, there cannot be an inference that in the particular case which he is facing trial, he, uh, he had committed the theft. So a charge as ordained by the cardinal rules of criminal jurisprudence must be proved. Then simply because in an earlier case, a witness has forged a document, it does not mean his evidence should be discarded in a subsequent case where his title to his own property is involved. So therefore, character evidence is generally inadmissible. Here, I would like to draw the attention of the youngsters to section 54 of the Indian Evidence Act. Supposing evidence about a character of a particular witness is already given and it is sought to be adduced that he is a person of good character, then the evidence in reply regarding character is admissible and relevant. This is section 54. So when we are talking about character, the youngsters must take note of the fact that character has got two components. One is reputation, the other is disposition. Reputation in my considered view is the credit one has in the public domain. Reputation is a credit of that person, in other words, in the estimation of the others. The credit one has in the estimation of others is called reputation. Then what is the disposition? Disposition is his nature his inherent qualities. Only people who move close to him will be knowing about his disposition, his nature, his qualities. A person may be a reputed businessman. That is his, that is his reputation in his business circles. But he may be regularly quarreling with his son in the house. That is his disposition, which is known to his own family members and close relatives, but not to outsiders. So when we are talking about character, and evidence of character is being given, these two kinds of uh, mean components of character must be borne in mind by the trial court judge. Another important aspect, which rarely happens nowadays in trial courts. The suit is based on a document. If the document is proved, the plaintiff succeeds. If the document is not proved or disproved, the defendant succeeds. Section 3 of the Indian Evidence Act, proved, not proved, disproved is very, very important while receiving evidence and also while appreciating evidence at the time of final judgment. Evaluation of evidence is very, very important task which a judge has to perform. See, in that case, which is based on a document, the plaintiff's case is that the document is written in the own hand of the defendant. The defendant's defense is that the document is a rank forgery. He did not write that document. He did not sign that document. Then unfortunately, there is no other document written by the defendant which can be produced for comparison. More particularly, there is no document of a contemporary period, more or less written at the same time 
when the disputed document is written, then what is to be done? The plaintiff's counsel is a well-prepared, well-informed trial lawyer. Therefore, during the course of the trial, when the defendant is in the box and when he is being cross-examined, the learned counsel for the plaintiff makes a request to the trial court and seeks permission of the court to permit him to dictate in open court some matter to the defendant who is in the box and would ask the defendant to reduce the same into writing on a piece of paper. On permission being granted and a piece of white paper being given to the witness by the court officer, the learned advocate dictates some matter and asks the witness to write down the same on the piece of paper supplied to the witness. He will take care to see that the matter dictated is different but contains in its content certain specific, distinctive, peculiar, uncommon words and figures which are already there in the disputed document as it is common knowledge that every writer has his own style of writing and the size of letters, slant of letters, margins, spacing between the letters, spacing between the lines, height of the letters, width of the letters, connections between the letters, and words, etc. are peculiar to each writer. Finally, after this dictation is reduced into writing by the witness, the piece of paper is given to the court. It will be marked in court series, C series, because it, it belongs neither to the plaintiff nor to the defendant. It is marked in the C series. Then there is one writing of the defendant which is written in the court hall to the dictation of the cross-examining counsel. Then this piece of document will be placed in juxtaposition with the disputed document and the court will compare both the handwritings and it may be of some help along with other evidence to come to a just decision in the matter. And another advantage is this piece of paper and the disputed document which contains the disputed writing can both be sent to an expert and a report can be called for from an expert because an expert can always know even if the defendant designedly disguises his writing, the expert can find it out and say whether the disputed writing is that of the defendant or not. This is another important courtroom practice. In such situations, when a plaintiff's counsel or for that matter, the defendant counsel makes a request of similar nature, the trial court shall not decline. Right. Next aspect. A witness is summoned to produce a document. He produced a document. Then the lawyers say they may be permitted to cross-examine him. The question is whether the trial court shall permit such a request. My humble view is a person summoned to produce a document does not become a witness by mere fact that he produced it. He cannot be cross-examined. And moreover, without a chief examination, there cannot be a cross-examination. He cannot be cross-examined unless called as a witness to give evidence and also produce the document. Please see section 139 of the Indian Evidence Act. Then, if time permits, I will take up another illustration. Accused is before a trial court, in a court of session. The trial is going on. The learned prosecutor wanted to rely upon a statement of a person which was recorded by a judicial magistrate of first class, maybe a confessional statement. The prosecutor wanted to rely upon that. The accused said, this statement, this disposition, this deposition is improperly recorded by the magistrate. Therefore, he wants to cross-examine the magistrate who recorded the statement. 
whether the trial court, this court of session, can permit cross examination of a magistrate who recorded a statement who discharged his official duty. In my view, without the permission of a superior court, the magistrate cannot be compelled to appear as a witness and be cross examined. Please see section 121 of the Indian Evidence Act. If such a magistrate is to be examined in rarest of rare cases, unless permission of a superior court is obtained, he cannot be called as a witness. Sarji, shall I continue? Or we will stop for interaction. We can do the interaction. Second part, we can take it next week. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So what can be done is before we take the questions, uh, in a five minutes, sum, it, uh, sum up can be done. Oh, you yes. So this is how the courtroom practices go on. There are some more practices which we can share. For example, in the next meeting, next session, we can say, uh, share these following aspects. See, parties sailing together like one brother files a suit for partition. Another brother is the defendant. He is sailing with the plaintiff brother, but the sister is the contesting defendant. The question would be, when the plaintiff is examined, whether the defendant who is sailing with the plaintiff shall examine in chief, further examine in chief, or cross-examine the plaintiff brother. That is one important aspect. Another, another aspect is a suit for partition is decreed. A preliminary decree is passed. Then a final decree is also passed. In the final decree, for partition of the properties by meets and bounds, a commissioner is appointed. The commissioner filed a report. He incidentally said that a house property is not partiable. It is a small house, so it has to be auctioned between the sharers. If the sharers are not willing to I mean, purchase, then it should be put to public auction and the money should be shared between the parties. Then one of the parties says, we will cross-examine the commissioner. In such a case, whether the commissioner can be permitted to be cross-examined. Then one witness, expert has come to give evidence. A request is made that he will be cross-examined by another expert, not by the lawyer whether that can be permitted. So there are, these are many more such courtroom practices which arise day in and day out in trial courts. We'll consider some of them in the next session. Thank you for the patient hearing. Uh, on the YouTube, at least, we don't have any questions. And in fact, one of the reasons is that if, uh, the immediate neighbor is having some function. There's a lot of eco. Okay. Sir, so I have doubts whether sub-registrar can examine as witness to identify the persons who are all present at the time of registration if it is without examining the attester and also prove the genuineness of the documents. What is your take? Sir, when a document goes to registration, there are two aspects. The document, whether it is compulsorily attestable or not, will be attested because it is being taken to registrar's office for registration. Sometimes the attesting witnesses figure as identifi identifying witnesses. There is no hard and fast rule that the attesting witnesses shall alone figure as identifying witnesses. After the attested document is taken for registration, somebody else may identify the executant and the registrar may confirm from the identifying witnesses the identity and then the document will be registered. But the question is, Neither the attesting witnesses nor the identifying witnesses are examined. Take, for example, it is a sale deed. It is not a compulsorily attestable document. Therefore, the purchaser examined himself. He is satisfied that the execution is proved. But the opposing, part, opposing party says that the person who went to the registrar office and executed the document is not the executant. There is impersonation. Then how to prove? Presently, after the Aadhaar system has come, 
now we are taking the aadhar as a proof and then also the what do you call that uh, thumb impressions on the mean uh, that machine are being taken they are comparing the thumb impressions of the executant with the aadhar details that are available on the web land therefore this problem of identification is not arising nowadays and earlier also the, there is a system of affixing photographs of the executant as well as the others who are parties to the document so the photograph the person appearing for execution both are there unless the photograph is also manipulated the question of examining the examining the subregister does not arise in the present days supposing a old document is in question then the question is day in and day out the subregister will be exam registering number of documents is it possible for him to remember to remember the witnesses identity by looking at their faces physical identity i mean and also that of the executant supposing the executant in a given case is a lawyer he is a famous lawyer or because a lawyer went as a identifying identifying witness to identify his own client at the time of examination the subregister may in given case because of the reputation of the person may identify but not in all cases but not in all cases and then the presumption is all official acts have been regularly done unless the contrary is proved so if on that presumption it is relied upon then and the rebuttal evidence has to be adduced by the opposite party who is opposing saying that the pers- there is impersonation the burden the initial onus is upon him therefore if the evidence is strong enough then only the question of uh, summoning the registrar as a witness would arise what is marking of a document subject to proof is not the admissibility of document uh, to be decided then and there itself yes sir x so far as uh, documents which are uh, liable for stamp duty when an objection is raised that the document is inadmissible because it is insufficiently stamped we get an answer in bipin shantilal panchal's case that such an objection shall be decided then and there such objection cannot be postponed to a later date but if the objection does not relate to the stamp duty and it relates to some other aspect like it is secondary evidence it is a photostat copy it cannot be marked such is the objection then the objection can be sometimes postponed but so far as the stamp duty is concerned the the objection must be decided then and there i will refer to ram ratan versus bajranglal and others ar 2001 supreme court 1158 the trial court before which the objection is taken about the admissibility of a document on the ground that it is not duly stamped has to judicially determine the matter as soon as the document is tendered in evidence and before it is marked as an exhibit in the case it is also pertinent to note the ratio in the decision of bipin shantilal panchal's case i have already given the citation wherein the supreme court has made it clear that if the objection relates to deficiency of stamp duty of a document the court has to decide the objection before before proceeding further the liability to stamp duty arises under specific provision creating liability to determine whether any stamp duty is chargeable on an instrument the legal principle is the real and true meaning of the instrument that is the nature and character of the transaction embodied in the instrument is to be ascertained the description name given by the parties is immaterial madras refineries limited ar 1977 supreme court 500 also see om prakash case 2014 1 scc 618 the supreme court expressed agreement with the following conclusion of a division bench of the high court of madhya pradesh a reading of the provision of law makes it manifest that no instrument chargeable with duty shall be admitted in evidence for any purpose by any person having the authority to receive the evidence or shall be acted upon but one thing sir 
in trial courts what we see is supposing a photocopy is marked it is marked subject to objection that it is a photocopy without deciding the objection then at the time of final judgment it is rejected then the party loses an opportunity to adduce alternate evidence supposing it is rejected at the time of trial itself then he can find out alternate means to mean produce some other evidence to prove his case if the objection is postponed then there is a difficulty of the party losing an opportunity to adduce some other evidence in such a case there will be unnecessarily remands by the appellate courts to the trial courts so in such a cases my humble view is that it is better that the court decide so far as objection to a document is concerned admissibility of a document is concerned is decided then and there so that the party will have an opportunity to adduce some other evidence to prove his case if the document is rejected hope i am clear sir Uh, children's verbal uh, versions are taken for uh, granted as evidence, and it, if it is believed true, is the child's age limit fixed in such cases? Evidence. How to appreciate the evidence of a child? Is it not? Yeah. yeah. See, if a child witness comes, first of all, both shall not be admitted. We will record at the top of the deposition. that both is not administered a child is prone to tutoring so the court has to be very careful while the child is being examined tutoring can be in two ways one by threat the other by mean cuddling him by saying that he will be given some uh, ice creams some good food good treatment in the house like that some promises will be made and he will be lured to speak what is uh, mean tutored so hard he may be threatened in both cases he may be speaking what is not the truth generally in such cases the court will examine the demeanor of the witness and then record it in the deposition tomorrow the judge may be transferred if he just observes and keeps quiet it will not be borne out by the record the matter goes to the appellate court also if the demeanor demeanor is mentioned in the deposition itself at the bottom then it will be helpful to appreciate the evidence of that child and then generally in such cases what the courts generally do is a rule of prudence they look for corroboration they look for corroboration they don't generally rely upon the evidence of a child witness unless they are fully satisfied that the witness is speaking truth and what he says is gospel truth is it necessary to produce the original pro uh, property documents during the proving of a will certainly sir so far as the will is concerned the original document must be produced because the attestors have to identify their signatures the propounder of the bill has to identify the signature of his own father same na namely the document which is in dispute is the bill of a father one brother disputes it the other brother says that it is uh, the signature of the father then it is always preferable that the original document should be produced into court and moreover when the document is very much available the document is only intended to prove when a dispute is arises supposing a sale deed is there the title is in dispute what is the point in having a trade sale deed and not filing it into court when the dispute dispute arises sale deed is only taken only to prove the title whenever in future a dispute arises therefore in my view the original document should be produced 
the original document should be produced if the original document is lost the next provision which deals with the compulsory attestable documents how they are proved also says how such secondary evidence can be proved secondary evidence yeah, as you know sir it is a five kinds we can go to section 63 for that and when uh, original is lost in those five cases the secondary evidence is admissible the secondary evidence is admissible in shalimar chemical works case which is uh, 2010 8 scc 423 the supreme court categorically reiterated that the trial court cannot mark ex exhibits photocopies of documents in the face of objection raised by the opposite party and should have declined to take them on record as evidence and left it to the party who filed them to support its case by whatever means it proposed rather than leaving the issue of admissibility of those copies open and hanging by marking them as exhibits subject to objection and proof so the in shalimar chemical works case the court categorically said that it is not better to mark a document subject to proof and objection it is better to decide the objection then and there and leave the matter for the party to prove his case by some other supporting evidence He here you may also refer to sir R V E Venkata Chal Gounder's case R V E Venkata Chal Gounder's case dealing with order thirteen rule four of the C P C the Supreme Court said that a document can be rejected at any time if it is found inadmissible and not relevant and in this case the court has divided the objections. regarding proof of documents into two categories one objection is that the document sought to be proved is itself inadmissible in evidence that is the first category the second category is where the objection does not dispute the admissibility but it is directed towards mode of proof mode of proof in the second category the objection must be taken and it and if it is not taken it is deemed as waived the objection cannot be taken later but supposing the document is inherently admissible the objection can be raised at any time even during the course of hearing of the second appeal also such an objection can be raised that is uh, what is stated in this decision of the supreme court rve venkata chal gounders case the next question is when can a mark doc uh, mark exhibit be treated as a can be seen by the judge in the trial court when can be i am not able to see when can the mark exhibit be seen by the judge in the trial court i am still not able to catch sir when can the marked document be uh, treated as an exhibit by the trial court then we we must go to order 13 order 13 sir see when once a document is produced in evidence say for example a plaintiff gets into box and files a a, a promissory note or a title deed then it is admissible it is also relevant proof is different mere marking is not proof then the says this suit promissory note is exhibit a1 or the suit sale deed 
relating to suit schedule property is exhibit A1. Then an endorsement will be made on the document. That endorsement will be as per order 13 rule 4. Subject to the providence of the next following sub rule, there shall be endorsed on every document which has been admitted in evidence in the suit in the following particulars, namely the number and title of the suit, the name of the person producing the document, the date on which it was produced, and a statement of its having been so admitted, and the endorsement shall be signed and initialed by the judge. Once that particular rubber stamp is put, and the columns in that uh, unfilled columns are filled by the bench clerk, and the judge initials the documents, the marking is complete in the IF law. The marking is complete in the IF law. Where a document so admitted is an entry in a book, account, or record, and a copy thereof has been submitted for the original under the next following rule, the particulars of aforesaid, aforesaid shall be endorsed on the copy and the endorsement thereon shall be signed and initialed by the judge. Supposing the original is a voluminous document, like a revenue record is brought. It relates to 100 survey numbers, but only one survey number is in question in the suit. The entire revenue record need not be kept in the court. The relevant page after comparison of the original with the photocopy can be taken and the photocopy can be marked. The judge will make an endorsement that the photocopy is compared with the original. The original will be returned to the witness. The photocopy will be marked. Unless there are interpolations in the original record, the original record will not be retained in the court. It will be returned because it is daily needed by the revenue authorities for day-to-day -day maintenance. Similarly, a banker's book, account book, it may contain entries of several customers. One page is relevant for the suit that will be taken and will be marked, a photocopy will be marked and the original will be returned saying that the copy marked is compared with the original. Similarly, a witness's identity is in doubt. Then he produces his Aadhaar card. Aadhaar card is regularly required for him at several places. Similarly, he produces a driving license to prove his identity. Then a copy will be taken. Copy will be retained in the court and will be marked as an exhibit. The original will be returned to the witness. That is how, in some cases, copy will be marked with an endorsement. In all other cases, original will be marked with an endorsement. When the endorsement is made in the court hall and the endorsement is signed by the judge, the marking is complete in the IF law. Is there any difference between attestation and endorsement? Attestation? And endorsement. Yes, sir. Endorsement is supposing attestation is attestation is defined in the Indian Evidence Act. And also the Indian Stamp Act. It is defined. So far as endorsement is concerned, supposing the suit is on the foot of a promissory note, the limitation period is three years. In the third year, the defendant brought 100 rupees and paid as part of consideration, part of the debt. Then on the reverse of the promissory note, an endorsement is made stating that the defendant paid 100 rupees and acknowledged the debt. It extends the period of limitation by another three years. That is an endorsement. Attestation means attestation of a will by an attestor. That is, the acknowledgement shows that the attestation shows that he has personally seen the executant voluntarily with free will and consent signing the document. Or in the alternative, if the executant has already signed the document, then His evidence is that he received an acknowledgement from the executant that he voluntarily signed the document with his free will and consent and that he made a request to attest the document and therefore he attested the document. He will prove execution there. He will prove 
execution there with free will and consent that is attestation attestation is defined under the indian evidence act i will try to give the provision of law section 60 section 63 within brackets small c of the indian succession act says bills are compulsory registerable attestable section 59 of the transfer of property act says that money secured by a mortgage is compulsorily attestable section 123 of the transfer of property act says a gift of immovable property or settlement deed is compulsorily attestable Section two five of the Indian Stamp Act says bond is compulsorily attestable. Then what is meant by word attestation? Attestation is defined in section three of the Transfer of Property Act. Attested in relation to an instrument means and shall be deemed always to have been attested by two or more witnesses, each of whom has seen the executant sign or affix his mark to the instrument. or has seen or some other person sign the instrument in the presence and by the direction of the executant or he or has received from the executant a personal acknowledgement of his signature or mark or of his signature of such person and each of whom has signed the instrument in the presence of the executant but it shall not be necessary that more than one of such witnesses shall have been present at the same time and no particular form of attestation shall be necessary lalita ben jayanti lal properties case 2008 15 scc 365 then section 68 of the indian evidence act says proof of execution of a document required by law to be attested janki narayan bohair's case is very very important to know the distinction between attestation and endorsement ar 2003 supreme court 761 ar 2003 supreme court 761 janki narayan bohair's case supposing a will is lost section 71 of the act comes to the rescue how the second day evidence in such case can be proved is stated in section 71 section 68 is not an enabling section it is a, a section which requires uh the necessary requirement stated in the section to be proved it is mandatory section 3 of the transfer of property act not evidence act i'm sorry as i was mentioning very very important aspect only one attestor is examined he must be able to prove attestation by two witnesses supposing he speaks of attestation by himself alone and he cannot speak of the attestation by the other witness then the evidence will fall short of attestation as defined under the enactment so the last question we are taking the rest of the question we will take next time Uh, how to de exhibit the exhibited document that is a, that's a very very important question sir how to de exhibit a document there are conflicting decisions in these two high courts of telangana and andhra pradesh i have held that a document can be de exhibited i have taken a clue clue from the decision just now i have given i have already pointed out pointed out one provision of law that is rule 3 of order 13 which says the court may at any stage of a suit reject any document which it considers irrelevant or otherwise inadmissible regarding the grounds for such rejection the court can at any time reject a document which is inadmissible 
provided the court records reasons for such rejection so therefore my humble view is the document can be rejected document can be exhibited be exhibited that is my view of the matter after i have taken a decision accordingly in the andhra pradesh high court another single judge disagreed with me though subsequently several single judges followed my view he ought to have referred the matter to a division bench but he did not do so therefore in andhra pradesh high court there are two conflicting views so far as telangana high court is concerned the law is well settled the law is well settled the learned judges of telangana high court successively held that there can be de exhibition of a document once marked mere marking is not proof if the document is inadmissible in evidence or it is not relevant the court can de exhibit the document uh, after uh, an application is filed in that regard ap leli versus gurnam ramarao 2017 6 andhra legal decisions 300 2017 6th andhra legal decisions 300 i have taken a clue from rve venkatachal gounders case in this case as i already mentioned the objections to admissibility are classified into two categories the first category is mode of proof this objection must be taken at the time of marking if not taken it is considered as waived and it cannot be taken at any later stage of any proceeding supposing if the objection relates to inherent admissibility of a, a document then though the document is exhibited this objection because it relates to inherent admissibility can be taken at any time at any time even in the second appeal that is what is stated in rve venkatachal gounders case i will also give another citation of our high court Yes, Eri Varap Prasad Reddy, 2018, Volume Five, Andhra Legal Decisions, Three Nine Six. You can also take down A.R. Two Thousand Three Supreme Court Four Five Four Eight, R.V. Venkata Jalgaunders Case. <coughs> so, in my view, the document can be de-exhibited. document can be de exhibited so first of all first of all why a document inadmissible will come to be marked the judge must be overlooking and by mistake by oversight the document gets marked or non application of mine by the judge otherwise a document will not come to be marked when it is inadmissible say for example an insufficiently stamped sale deed a sale deed is written on a white paper it is marked for a mistake of a court sir you are saying something am i audible for a mistake of a court no but no party should be penalized see the judge without performing his duty admits into evidence a document which is inadmissible that is another re reason which should weigh with the court when a document is de exhibited for a mistake of a court no party should be penalized even though there are conflicting decisions in the ap high court rve venkatachal gounders case which is a supreme court decision is a complete answer to the question whether a document can be de exhibited in my humble view that that should that decision holds the field and the document can be de exhibited provided it is either not relevant or is inadmissible in evidence thank you sir for sharing your knowledge and with you we will fix up the date and we will share it on the social media when we can take the session and uh, the next session we will have though we will request sir to have a second session in between second session by mr yuvraj singh who has written the book on electronic evidence 
That will be practical tips on electronic evidence by Yuvraj on 24th. Do stay connected with us on 6 p.m. Meanwhile, we will connect, sir, for a second part of it. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Stay safe. Stay blessed. Namaskar. Thank you. Hope the session will be useful. Thanks.